Wow, look at all these countries. Hi from Australia. Yes, I'm in Australia. And Simone, tell us where you're calling in from. I'm calling in from the Netherlands, but you might be able to also hear that I um, originally am from Australia. I've just been living here for the last 14 years, but I grew up in Sydney. Amazing. So everyone, if you don't know me already, I'm sure you've seen some of my videos. Um, I am the CEO and founder of Guide and Grow, and also we own the largest Montessori support network in the world on our Facebook group called Montessori at Home, zero to three years. So if you haven't already joined us in that group for all things Montessori, zero to three years, it's a great discussion forum. We've got lots of resources. They're all free. Um, some great discussions and we are super, super excited to be joined by Simone Davies, um, author of The Montessori Toddler. So you guys have all seen that book. Um, she is releasing, she has co-authored a new book called The Montessori Baby um, with her good friend. I'm sure she's a very good friend of yours, Junifa, as well. Um, so Simone, tell us about a little bit about the book. Why, what made you decide that you wanted to write The Montessori Baby? Yes, yeah, so actually we just finished um, the book tour for the Montessori toddler and we came back from America and people were already saying, oh, I wish I had have known about all of this information earlier and Montessori toddler was able to make Montessori accessible to many more families. Um, and so we decided to write the Montessori baby, but starting from conception, like we do in our um, assistance to infancy training, right through the first year, for the first 12 months and then move on to the Montessori toddler. And I was anxious to do it myself because whilst I've worked in Montessori parent-child classes and had parent-baby classes for over 15 years and helped many families apply it, I hadn't actually learned about Montessori myself when my babies were small. So I hadn't used a floor bed and it's really hard. So I really wanted to, yeah, I didn't feel authentic to be able to write it by myself. Um, and when Juniper was in Amsterdam at an AMI board meeting, she's part of the Association Montessori International Board, um, she'd come over to my house for dinner just to have a home-cooked meal. And I, I was telling her about this idea that I'd really like to co-author the Montessori Baby with someone. She's like, oh, no way. When I was on the airplane, I was starting to like think about writing a book about babies. And I even have like some points that I wrote down. And so at the kitchen table that night, we drafted the outline for the Montessori baby and it was born. Yeah. That's such an incredible story because I know myself and a lot of questions that we get asked in the group all the time. You know, everyone's asking what book do we kind of recommend for Montessori from the start? And a lot of the um, books that are out there are quite outdated or they're, you know, they're from 10, 20 years ago. So I think it's really important that, you know, we have such an amazing kind of like a manual that will really help people on their journey right from the start. Um, and so, yeah, we're super excited to be promoting that today. But we have some uh, lots of questions that have been written in um, by our viewers tonight and some people that are in our Montessori group. So what we're going to do, um, guys, if you have any um, questions that you come up, please feel free to type them in. Um, show us your love. If you like what Simone's saying or what I'm saying, you know, hit the like button, hit the love button. Um, hello from Texas. Hi, Liz. Um, good morning. Yes, actually, good evening to everyone in Australia. Good, very early good morning to those in the USA and Canada, and also a good day to everyone in Europe because I know um, that we are, you know, broadcasting from all around the world, and it's so exciting to be able to have people join us for this discussion. Um, my mum's even watching. Hi, mum. Um, so yeah, we're going to get stuck into the questions um, and then we're going to do our giveaway. So if whoever's entered our giveaway, you've got a chance to win two copies of the Montessori baby, one for you and one for a friend. So we're going to draw that winner live um, towards the end of our Q&A. So Simone's dedicated um, a lovely, you know, almost one hour of her time to join us today. So we're really thankful to have you with us. Um, and I guess I'm going to get started with the questions. And then if you guys have any comments um, when you're watching live, feel free to type them into the chat. I'll be keeping my eye out on the chat. Hi. Oh, hi, Ella. <laughs> how are you? Okay. So we've got our first question. So our first question is how many and which languages are the book expected to be published in? 
Um, for the Montessori baby, I think there's already like 15 languages being translated, um, which is very exciting. And um, they, the Italian version's already out. It actually managed to beat the English version, which is very funny. The Dutch version's coming out in June and um, many more over the next 12 to 18 months, but it's not instantaneous, so it depends on the place. And um, the Montessori toddlers now in 31 countries, so we're hoping that many of those same countries will get on board to do the baby book as well. Because it just shows how international Montessori is. Like, the publisher was surprised themselves. They couldn't believe it. And we're like, I'm actually not surprised because Montessori is in so many countries around the world. Yeah, absolutely is. Um, okay, so Julie has asked, um, as a couple, what are important areas to reflect on before adopting the Montessori pedagogy at home? So the thing that comes up for me is like the preparation on ourselves and are we really ready to let go of the control of the situation? Because I think Montessori is trusting in our child's development and following their, their lead. And particularly when we're talking about Montessori with babies, um, nowadays it's like, oh, well, 80% of their brains develop by the time they're three. So I need to push and, you know, make them learn faster and quicker and buy more stuff. And actually stepping back and looking at our child in front of us and observing not like what milestone everyone else's child is meeting, but trusting our own child's development. So it's really like actually quite hard work. And it would, it's good to recognize every time you're challenged by, oh yeah, I wish that they'd be doing this. And is this my need or their need? Um, so I think that would be the first thing that I would come up with is like, how do you prepare yourselves to really be curious about the child in front of you and be respectful to that child? Yeah, I think that's a really great point. It's almost like we have to, you know, remove ourselves, you know, away a little bit and have that observer hat on so that we can really see how we can respond to the child's needs. I think that's a really great um, point to make. Okay. Our I mean, next because question. we can be there to, oh yes, oh, no, we, we can be there to prepare. Them. Yeah, we can be there to prepare the environment and to link them with the environment. Um, but, and we're part of the environment because I think we all, I, Jennifer and I always say that we are the most important piece of material in like a baby's environment in the first 12 months. Um, so I think that would, yeah, that's what I would say though, is definitely the work on ourselves first. And Jennifer actually is in the comments. I don't know if she can come on live or not, but um, yes. if maybe is she can pop um, out. And you can yeah, absolutely. We might do that. Um, I'll see if I can find her. Um, is she, is, Jennifer, if you're in here, can you um, give me a wave at um, or a comment or something and I can see if I can add you in um, to the conversation. We might do um, like a couple more questions and then we can get Jennifer in. I'd love to have her online as well. Um, okay, so Chantel, um, she's actually one of our moderators in our Facebook group. She says, now that your children are older, what do they think about having been raised in a Montessori lifestyle? What were their favourite aspects? Okay, so I actually haven't asked them specifically because um, I haven't seen them. They're now 20 and 19. But generally, like, I think that they just think it's a really respectful way to raise children um, because it was always their opinions were always um, allowed to be aired. We tried to solve conflicts by talking about it. We accepted each child for, you know, the things that they wanted to do. Um, and, you know, they really loved, they did Montessori up until the end of primary school, up until 12 years old. And, you know, they enjoyed school. They liked going. Um, but ironically, my son, he always says, you know, I had enough of Montessori by the time and what he just chose as a traditional high school, which I think is really funny because I guess you hear about it at home all the time from your mother. <laughs> and then um, he actually found that when he went to a traditional school, it was really easy. They just told me what to do and I got on and did it. So actually, I think it is challenging. It's the more difficult option, Montessori, like having all of this freedom of choice and having to plan your day and, and those kind of things. Um, but when, I, when we go and visit family and friends and they see people raising their children in different ways, we have some interesting discussions afterwards about how they've appreciated how we've raised them in a Montessori way. That's so beautiful. With no judgment to other people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, so I've just seen Jennifer in the comments, but uh, if if you're not Jennifer, if you're um, you've just got to log on with a mobile phone so that a little camera icon comes up next to your profile because it's not giving me an option to join you in 
um, on the camera just yet. So maybe if you can see if you can jump on a mobile app, it will allow me to join you in as a video chat. If not, we're happy to um, have you in the comments and then I'll ask you some questions that you can comment um, and the answer to. All right, so our next question comes from Beck Lee and she says, what do you, oh, this is a tough one. <laughs> what do you think is the biggest tip for new parents? Ah, for new parents. Okay. Well, Montessori teachers love saying to observe, right? But it really is so true because we come with so many preconceived ideas and like our baby needs to feed and eat. And actually the only person that can tell us when they're hungry is the baby, you know, and we have to follow their cues. And when you're a new parent, it's really hard to know what the cues are. So I like to be able to just reassure, reassure parents. It's like, it's going from, um, First they will feed, then they'll play a little bit, and then they'll sleep. You know, they'll feed, they'll play a little bit, then they'll sleep. And the play is so short. Um, so that they at least have some idea, okay, they're getting a bit like grizzly now. Oh, maybe they're hungry. You know, you start to doubt yourself. But actually when you observe, you start to see what the cues are for your baby. So I think observing um, would be one thing. Using gentle hands would be another as well, like because our baby, the way we touch them and handle them is giving them trust in the world and trust in themselves. So like if we don't consciously pay attention to how we pick them up, we're giving them the idea that the world's a bit rough or whatever, but we're compare that to when you just say, oh, I'm going to pick you up right now. And then you use your gentle hands, you know, to hold them um, or even just wait even a moment for them to maybe lift their head a little bit or they, they raise their arms. You know, you're already teaching them respect and getting consent before you handle them. And then when you're changing their diaper, instead of, you know, picking up their legs loosely from the ankles, you know, just I'm going to, you know, push your ankles forward really gently. Ready? And telling them what you're doing. And plus they're getting really rich language. You're using these moments of care um, as moments of connection. Because I know I was guilty of like rushing through the diaper changing so that I could get on and get on to the play where they're going to learn something. And actually they learn so much just from the connection with us. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. I think that a lot of the time parents feel like they need to be doing things with their baby. So the doing of the activities and the this and the that, but they don't realize, like you mentioned, the daily routine of, you know, diapering or feeding. Those are real moments of connection. Those are learning opportunities. And those are the times that we can teach that consent, respect, communication, and look for those cues where they're actually responding to us as well. So I think that's a really, um, um, yeah, beautiful point to make. Um, okay, so I've just got some um, Jennifer. Simone, do you mind if I see if I can just get her on camera at the same time? Yeah. I'm just going to see if we're oh, able yeah, sure. to do that. Okay. Oh, okay, so it's only going to let me do one person at a time. So what we might do is we might just go through maybe, you know, two or three more questions and then I might get her on and we'll do a swap out. <laughs> If, I love um, that. Yeah, Jennifer, perfect. Jennifer, Thank you. Let Thank me you. Know. Oh, that's okay. Jennifer, let me know if you've got some time, how much time you have so I can um, swap you out with Simone and then we can continue the discussion. Okay. So we actually have a live um, question from Bailey. Hi, Bailey. Um, so she says, will there be a Montessori teenager book or a book for after age three? <laughs> Yeah, so Jennifer and I are working on it. So if people know, my um, specialty is working with children under three. So I'm helping Jennifer to write the three to 12 year old book, um, which is The Montessori Child. Um, it's going to be a few years in the making. And there is one chapter that we're working on on the Montessori adolescent um, so that you know what's coming next as well. But it's so true. Oh, wow. Like at the Montessori talked about you know, the planes of development and there being a series of rebirths. So between zero and six, there's similar characteristics. And then six to 12, you have a completely different child. And what they need from us at that moment is different. So I, yeah, we'd love to make a handbook for you to so help guide you on the next parts of the journey as well. Sounds absolutely amazing. Um, so Megan is also live with us. Hi, Megan. She asked, my baby is nine months old. What age does toddlerhood start and would it be worth getting the Montessori baby? So yeah, this one goes up to 12 months old. So I think you'd still get a lot out of the 
information about nine to 12 months, like there's still a lot in there. And also you'll like, get an understanding of what's been going on that first whole year. Um, and then you, or you could just move on to the toddler book and then retrospectively kind of apply the principles, but the things like the activities, what they're actually working to master between nine to 12 months, that's all articulated in the baby book. Yeah. Amazing. Um, I'm so excited for people to see the inside of this book. I don't know how much I'm allowed to give away. <laughs> but I No, yeah, feel so free. It's so free. pretty. It's, it's so pretty. pretty. <laughs> um, so we had um, a question saying, so where are the books um, available for purchase? So I will let everybody know we're going to drop a few links um, after this discussion we're going to drop all the links where you can purchase the books from and also i know simone this might be a good time for you to let viewers know what they're going to get if they pre-order the montessori baby oh yeah so if you order before um the 11th of may when it's um go officially launch date then the publisher has organized some beautiful pre-orders um so you don't automatically get them you need to upload your order details um so uh you can get that from my website, the Montessori Notebook.com, I guess, where you yeah. upload the pre-orders, or maybe you can drop it into the chat for them. Okay. Yeah, we'll perfect. And then you basically, yeah, you get like a, a DIY mobile template so you can make your own mobile. We've made a guided journal so that you'll have all of the characteristics and things they're working on on one side of the page, and you'll have observation, room to write observations on the other side. We've got like checklists for um, my favorite one is the notes for our visitors um, because then you can hang that on your fridge and when your visitors come over it will be just like a little checklist of like some of the really important things um, that they should know about how to handle your baby in a Montessori way um, and a calendar and another checklist as well so yeah there's lots of great bonuses just for fun um, so if you get your order in before the 10th of May um, you'll be eligible and actually what's great is because they're digital pre-order bonuses you can be in australia you can be in india you can be anywhere and you just have to upload your order details you don't have to order from yeah you can order from your local bookseller but also sylvia will post the links to where you can get it yeah well. absolutely i'll make sure that everybody has all the links um so you know exactly where to pre-order and so all of you have access to those amazing oh hi pamela i saw pamela green pop her hand up <laughs> hi pam um <laughs> yeah, so you all have uh, you all have those access to those amazing resources um and on that note i heard you say something about having some notes for people that come and visit now i know we had some questions about you know how do you handle either you know grandparents or you know other family members or people you know that are outside of your family um on board or you know to kind of have keep in mind some of those montessori principles or how do you actually tackle that yeah so i think it can be really difficult because a lot of people get defensive particularly if it's your parent and you're saying oh can you do this differently as if like the way you raised me wasn't good enough so they get really defensive so the thing that i like to do is be a model and to keep modeling it um and also know that maybe they'll never get montessori so um and that's okay too um, unless they become like a primary caregiver then you really want to be in a conversation about like what you plan for the day to look like but if you're occasionally at your parents house and they do it in a different way remember that over like love is more important than it being a montessori way because they're sharing their love in the way that they know so i think understanding where the other person's coming from rather than getting irritated see oh, that's how they show love isn't that interesting and then um, I had a lovely podcast um, episode with Gabriel Salamo from La Montessori in Brazil. And he gave such a beautiful explanation of how he works with families like this. And he just said, like, imagine if you just go outside and, you know, you're with your family member and you're watching your child at play. You can kind of just say things like, look how much they enjoy, like, to climb on that frame all by themselves. Like, yeah, look how capable they are. Look how they smile. And, you know, point out the joy and how capable they are all the time. And if they're at home and they're pouring a glass of water and the adults trying to interview you, say, like, let's just wait. Let's just see. Wow, they're really enjoying that, aren't they? And just keep pointing out the joy and how capable the child is. I thought that was such a nice, non-pushy way to just um, keep modeling. And he said, don't even use the word Montessori for months because they're going to just push yeah. people away where they won't really understand it. Um, yeah. But anyway, if you want to be a little bit more direct, you can send them, I think about who you're talking to, like, is, would they do, read a blog, blog post or would they listen to a podcast interview or would they read the book, you know, so what are they going to be most like enticed by or even um, I've seen like some partners have a hard time getting on board and then like maybe they would relate more to someone who you know 
they even know from work or something who also is doing the same thing and they're like oh okay that's more relatable to me than you know these instagram mums who i don't know anything about <laughs> or there's some great instagram dads i now keep referring people to um an instagram account called at what dad did and um he's actually based in australia he's from dominica um originally and um his partner and him are both deaf and raised their children um their daughter in a montessori way and it's really inspiring so um that might be more relatable for a dad for example to get on board yeah, absolutely. Now that's some really great advice because a lot of the time, like I, uh, parents ask me, you know, how do I get my partner on board or how do I do this? And that's what I say. I say celebrate those little wins that you might have or, you know, and, and kind of showcase what they are capable of or the little successes like, oh, you know, I said such and such to my child and they responded this way. And it was so lovely to see that. So you're almost subliminally saying, you know, this really worked for me. Um, yeah, so things like that are really, really helpful. All right, so we have a question live from Celeste Wong. Hi, Sylvia and Simone. Hi, Celeste. Do you mind to share what to do if a child starts to throw things or food? How can we react um, if a child is around 10 months old um, and they're, you know, getting really frustrated and throwing things and stomping their feet when they get upset? which is quite a complex question and i think it has a few parts in terms of the throwing things or the food as well as then you know helping them communicate yeah so i think it's really interesting because at 10 months old there's a lot of going on developmentally but also they're starting to show some frustration i know that like i had twins in my class and the 10 month old boys they had to put away all the wooden toys because it was just getting super dangerous you know because they were throwing they're not intentionally trying to be naughty or anything they're like frustrated oh i want to move oh i have a need to throw right now so what can we give them that actually is okay to throw so it looks like you really want to throw i can't like that's really dangerous that's really heavy let's go and find a ball this is where we throw and you just keep showing them this is where we throw when you want to throw things um and if they finished with their food if they're throwing food it's usually not at the beginning of the meal it's usually towards the time when they're not actually eating so much more and then you can say oh are you all done are you all done and they can then learn to say the words i'm all done um eventually as well and when they're actually able to walk some 10 months old might be able to walk already and we show them that we take the plate to the kitchen we're modeling okay when you throw food the meal's all done and we take it and we're not getting angry at them like don't throw food this is them making a communication or showing some frustration or I actually don't want to eat that. That's okay too. Like, oh, you don't want to eat that. You threw it on the floor as opposed to getting to the game where we pick it up and, you know, we're not being super clear. So it's just to try and translate for them, I guess. Like, what are they trying to say right now? And I guess it would based on observation. Are they showing, like, if they're stomping their foot, they're frustrated. It didn't work out. Yeah, you look really upset about that. Is that did we not work out that way? You know, and just asking questions like that. And of course, a 10 month old can't answer, but they'll just start to feel heard and understood and they will get so much vocabulary from it as well. Yeah, and I think the biggest thing is that people don't underestimate the amount that a 10 month old or a nine month old or any month old child, a baby can actually understand. So when we use this rich language and communication with them, they actually can and do respond, but we have to be open to receiving those cues, you know, and when we do acknowledge their feelings. So this is something I really um, like to teach a lot of my parents is to really acknowledge the child. So when they are crying or upset or frustrating, you know, stomping their feet, it's so important to say, you look so frustrated. You know, that's so hard for you. So that they really try and understand then that feeling and then you can help them process that and then move through. Um, so yeah, I think those are some really, really great points that you've just brought up. Um, so okay. if, if I just think okay. off, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I will so, take a bite now and um, Juniper is going to jump in and we'll see if it works yeah. out. Okay. Thanks. All right. All right. Bye. All right, guys. So we are going to get on. Let's see if I can add Juniper. Juniper, I'm just adding you in. Um, it did work. Thank you. I can see all the comments. Definitely. So Juniper, I'm just going to try and add you in. Okay. I'm going to bring you on camera if you're there. Let's see if there's any response. to see if we can get Juniper on. Right. Juniper, can I add you in? No answer. All right, we might just, um, all right. Is that better? Can you guys hear me now? Better, a little bit better. I'm just gonna see if I can add Juniper on to the camera. No answer from your life, yes. 
right, Simone, I'm just going to add you back in until we can um, see if Juniper's around again. And she can just message me when we are. Did it work out? No. Um, no, Simone, I, she wasn't answering. So I'll just, uh, as soon as Simone left. Oh, okay, cool. Can you guys hear me loud and clear now? Can you guys give me a thumbs up or you can't hear me? I hear you. I think it's okay. Can you guys, if, if, ever, if anyone's listening, can you guys hear me okay? Can you give me a thumbs up? Maybe a little like? Oh, yep, we've got some thumbs up coming along. All right, awesome. Thanks, guys. So, um, so maybe we'll just keep going and then I'll see if I can get Juniper back in um, in a minute. Okay, okay. so um, we've got another question. Let's see. From... Okay, so this is a really good question, actually, because we get this question a lot of the time. Thanks for all the thumbs up, guys. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Giants. So nice to see some familiar faces in here, guys. Thanks for joining us live here with Simone Davies, co-author of The Montessori Toddler uh, and Baby. <laughs> it's so, it rolls off my tongue so quickly. All right, so Athena Meadows has asked, Montessori has been said to be for every child, but not for every family or parent. How do you know if Montessori is a good fit? And how would you introduce Montessori to a new or expecting parent? Okay, so um, Montessori teachers do like to say that Montessori is for every child because Montessori is adapted to every unique child. We see each child uniquely, like for the things that they're developing socially and gross motor and fine motor and language and everything as a whole picture. And we look at them with fresh eyes every day, right? Um, we also notice that like children will learn in different ways. So some children will walk into my classroom and they'll just stand there and observe the other children. And that is also learning because they're watching how an older child might be doing something or waiting their turn until um, it's available. They don't want to approach. Um, another child will be the complete opposite and they have their head down and just be concentrating on their own work. And that's the way that they learn by, you know just re repetition and mastering that way um there's kinesthetic learners who are children who work with their hands there's oral learners people who listen more visual learners and Montessori is hands-on learning materials so you can approach them in all the different ways so um, I find it so flexible um, also I just think that people think like if my child can't sit still then maybe they don't belong in that Montessori classroom because it's also <laughs> quiet in there you know everyone's so yeah. concentrated and I like to say that's almost the perfect child for Montessori because if they were in a traditional classroom they're just going to be so frustrated because they can't move around um, and in a Montessori classroom they could finish their activity they could go over to a gross motor activity there's yeah. movement actually built into so many Montessori activities activities anyway like in the way that in a practical life activity they have to pick things up um, take them over to the sink carry control their movements to pour the water into the jug um, you know and um, it's one of the things I love is that if someone spills something the two and a half year olds run to see who can be the fastest to get them up to help like mop up um, so <laughs> children who love movement no yeah. more than welcome in monster classrooms um, so that's Montessori for every child and then maybe not for, I used to say as well that Montessori is not for every adult because of like what we talked about in the very first question was that some of us are more authoritarian like authoritative like we just want to tell the children what to do and that kind of thing or some parents are more like laissez-faire and we're like oh well you know they can do whatever they like and I don't have any limits in my house or like they can draw on the walls I don't mind um, and that's not you know the thing but um, the same person Gabrielle Salomeo um, he posted something recently that actually Montessori can also be for every parent because we're all capable of learning this and if yeah. you model and keep working with these parents it's actually just a different way to start to show anyone that it's a respectful way to be with children and I thought that was so beautiful it's like yeah we're just instead of saying it's not for them it's just like yeah. oh well maybe they'll be open to learn someday I mean I can't force them to but I'm also not giving up hope on everyone as well so I thought that was really beautiful <laughs> It is really beautiful and I'm glad you're not giving up hope, <laughs> but I do think it's really about, <laughs> I really do think it is for, you know, it's a respectful way of parenting and I feel like it is if you are open to, you know, to learning and almost reparenting, you know, the way we might we do things, be open to doing things a little bit differently than our parents did with us or you know, just finding a way that feels right. But I really do believe that people need to do what's best for their family and what they feel is right, you know, for their child and their family. Um, 
so we have a question from Alexandra Price, who's also one of our moderators in our Montessori group. Now, this is a question that gets asked a lot around sleep. Um, so she says, I'm curious to see how the book approaches biologically normal infant sleep. Um, also wondering if professionals outside of Montessori were consulted like psychologists or breastfeeding experts and things like that. Okay, so uh, we wrote the Montessori baby book based on our experience in the Montessori classroom and um, some Rye principles as well. So the resources for infant edu educators. Um, we didn't go into um, every type of psychologist or baby you pressures because you can find people who have different approaches to breastfeeding. So we really tried to stick to the Montessori principles, but also with sleep, we know it's such a personal choice and. So what we really wanted to say is, okay, here are the Montessori principles and apply them as you see best. You know, so we start with observation and what are your child's cues when they're starting to get tired? How do they wake? How do they fall asleep? How much help do they need? Because like just when they're learning an activity, like, you know, from the Montessori toddler, we say, give as much help as necessary and as least possible. And we think of the same thing with sleep. It's like how little sleep, how little help do we need to give them? Because if we're always rocking them, and we've always been doing that since birth. We've never given them the opportunity to change that. So is there a way that we can gradually become less and less involved? And Jennifer and I talk a lot in the Montessori Baby about starting with dependence. They are dependent on us for their food and for, their, for us to move them and for us to help you know, provide the opportunity to sleep. Um, and then it moves to collaboration because actually we can't, close their eyes for them. They can, the only thing that they, they're in charge of is, you know, them actually falling asleep. So you can't actually, so when people say, how do I get my child to sleep? It's actually the wrong question in a way. It's just like, how can I support my child's sleep? Um, That's right. And then the collaboration and then independence. And some, everyone's going to be further along that or not, um, depending on their child and also on us, because some parents are going to be, faster they want themselves to get their own night's sleep so they're going to be motivated to move it along faster and so you're moving at the child's pace and also in relationship with you as well and other parents are going to be like actually i want to co-sleep so i'm doing this for me so as long as you know is this my child's need or is this my need um and just yeah. keep coming back to observation like what does my child need right now um and keep following that sleep um waking then they feed then they play then they sleep if you follow that cycle it usually helps a little because um you just don't get into that oh maybe they're hungry again or maybe they're hungry again and what happens is sometimes we're overfeeding them actually i see more children being overfed that's actually causing sleep problems because they don't have time to digest so as much as possible it's we, we definitely promote feeding on demand um in the book particularly in the first you know time and you'll notice that when you start to feed on demand then the baby will know over time and it, it is changing um i loved hearing um a recent a um mi usa refresher and the trainer erin i forgot her last name erin erin anyway she was talking about how she never actually latched on her child to feed they always attach themselves and i think that's a really long story thing as well is like you provide it but they actually left on themselves um so another thing i learned from bamela green i don't know if she's still on the call was natural breastfeeding positions and if you google that you'll find it really beautiful again it's the baby getting into position on you and it's a much more relaxed position you're almost laying back in the chair and I just feel like that really fits. So we, we basically found things that we felt aligned with the Montessori approach and include them in the book. And everyone will take what they need from it because I know when I was a new mom and I was like, how do I get my child to sleep? Um, I had read, oh, you keep the room dark and you provide consistent bedtime routines and all these kind of things, but I still couldn't get them to sleep. And I think if someone had just told me, it's not your responsibility to get them to sleep, it's how I can support your sleep. That would have hopefully helped me yeah. to realize yes, I can't actually make their eyes close. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's such a that's such a key point. And I know that there's so much information in the book that will help parents to guide them to understand how they can see the child, you know, as being equally, you know, responsive to, 
your cues and to be able to open that communication and read, you know, and wait for those signals so that then that way they feel more relaxed and it's not this stressful thing like, oh, you know, I need to do this and I need to, oh, my baby's not sleeping and, and what can, you know, and put taking a bit of that pressure off, you know, as a parent. Um, someone, Melissa just commented, I just love how passionate you are, Simone, and I totally agree. You know, it's so lovely to see such passion in, you know, other Montessorians from around the world. And I know that that is definitely um, shown in the book too. So yeah, <laughs> great comment. Um, the book is definitely uh, like a love letter to babies. And so we, yeah, love we do yeah, yeah, I love that. Um, Janifa, if you're still on, can you shout out, give us a little comment so that we know we can try and add you in again um, on the uh, on the chat. I, um, I just didn't see the you accepting the video so if you are on you can give us a little message um okay so we have a question that's oh and this is a look uh, quite a few questions that have come up between the two books um some people are asking carolyn um bowman is asking are there a lot of similarities between the advice that's given in this book compared to the montessori toddler yeah so they're definitely um well, like the Montessori principles apply at any age. So when the Montessori toddler came out, I said, you could apply this to the baby age. You could apply this at three to six age. But what the Montessori baby does is it goes into activities like this is what your child will be developing. And these are activities you can use to support them. Um, this is how we parent and the things, the different type of things that we need to think about as a parent for the newborn years. So it's much more articulated for babies, the zero to 12 months, the baby book. But yeah, of course, there's common philosophies follow through we have followed the child we have you know observation we have all of the different principles that like um uh that can will go right through through childhood right through to 24 years so i is that clearer i mean basically maybe they're wondering do i need to buy this as well and you don't have to yeah. actually what's really funny is a lot of people are buying it even if they don't have a baby because they want to understand what their child was going through in that first year and i think they would get a lot out of that and then you have it on hand and you can lend it to friends um you know just not suggestively pushing it onto somebody but yeah. it is a really accessible guide they could just open up like a page what's the way the montessori baby is written is similar to the montessori toddler with short chunks so you can read it from cover to cover or you can just open up oh i'm struggling with separation and attachment right now so i open to some separation anxiety kind of advice or something like that and they can do use it that way as well yeah absolutely and i think um you hit the nail on the head when you said that the best thing about this book um the montessori baby and the montessori toddler that i find is that you can literally just look up any topic any question you know, and even at, um, it, there's a really helpful list at the back as well. Um, Simone, you might want to talk about, you know, the little de development and all the activities and the list that you have, which is a really nice guide for parents that are looking for, you know, some sort of, um, like a, almost like a development of milestones or things that they can, you know, assess or, you know, use as a guide to help them understand what stages um, their baby's moving through. Well, yeah, everyone kind of says, oh, what activity should I give for a three month old? And so what we kind of say is, this is what your child might be developing at this age. So around three months old, there's visual development happening. There's um, auditory development happening. There's also a lot of gross motor movement happening. So if you put your baby on movement mat, as opposed to being in, in um, the Netherlands, they use these boxes a lot where children are kind of in play pens and they don't actually have free movement. But if you put them on the ground so they can see the whole space, um, then they've got the opportunity to hit at something like a ball that actually has a little bell inside that would meet all of those things for visual or um, and the physical development at the same time so at the back of the book we have like um, a list of activities and they've got guidelines for ages but as we said every child's unique so you need to be looking at what your child um, is uniquely developing right now but it gives you an idea oh yeah around three months my baby can grasp and actually hold on to the rail not just by the moral reflex but actually make it shake and have what kind of things to look for in a, in a rattle that you know, so your baby it's actually can fit into the hands that's made maybe from natural materials so they can feel that hot, cold, silk, you can make some silk like kind of things that they can grasp onto. There's beautiful silver rattles you can have. And then there's also the beautiful natural wooden ones as well. So it gives you lots of ideas um, for depending on which age it is and going right through up to 12 months old where they're starting to pull up and cruise and walk. And rather than we talk in Montessori about not putting a baby into a position that they can't get in 
to themselves. Um, you see so many exercises and things where people are trying to sit up their babies so quickly and actually their bodies are so much stronger when we wait until they can pull up themselves. So if you have a walking wagon, that's when they can actually pull up themselves and push the wagon without us pushing it for them um, and maybe slowing it down with a big box of books or something like that in it to make it slower and then keep adjusting it as they get more proficient. Yeah, that's a really great tip. I like that one. Um, and we also have on our um, Guide and Grow TV for anyone on YouTube who's on YouTube. There are lots of, like Simone was saying, we've got lots of you know, activity ideas and DIY stuff and things that you might want to, you know, set up for your um, for your child too. So you guys can, um, yeah, definitely jump on there. So the next question comes from Sarah Swan. Uh, she's also one of our moderators and I know she, I just saw her pop in um, to the live. So hi, Sarah. Um, so this is a little bit of a um, interesting question. It says, is there any aspect of Montessori you don't particularly like or haven't incorporated in your home? Um, well, I hadn't, didn't know about Montessori when my kids were babies. I found out when Oliver was 18 months old. So I didn't apply the floor bed and I wish I had it because I would be super curious about it. Um, but to be honest, I don't think there's anything I don't specifically agree with or anything. But for me, Montessori is about connection and from your heart parenting with respect and being with the child with respect and being open uh, to seeing the child with fresh eyes um, because I just want every child to feel welcome. And so I guess that if, when I see Montessori being sold as like, these are all the activities you need to buy and that kind of thing, then I'm not really subscribing to that part of Montessori. But in the same way, also I love seeing a child who is super focused, who comes to my play group, who is really engaged because you can see the peace that comes but they can get that same piece from being outside in the forest and you lying a baby on a mat and looking at the at the leaves moving so um also that it should be culturally appropriate because i've spoken to people who are from asia for example and feel like you know they the western world is telling them that their classroom should look like this and that's not actually authentically how it should look and jennifer i wish she could get on the call but um I, i've texted her as well and i, I think that um, okay. she's got to go back to her classroom um oh, no, but, uh, I want to tell you. I don't know. She hasn't answered. I'll let you know if she answers. Okay. Um, but yeah, she yeah. talks about culturally responsive Montessori as well, because when she bought some geography cards for her classroom, she's like, this is on the Africa that I live in. Like, this, I live in the city. I don't live, like, with, you know, things on my head. And, you know, so it's just, it's really, um, I guess I want Montessori to be more known for this respectful education as opposed to all of the, the, the stuff. I guess, and um, that's yeah. why I don't subscribe to yeah, absolutely. And I think that a lot of the time, you know, the, the issue comes up, we see it all the time. Everyone's like, oh, what activities should I do? And what, you know, what should I buy for my, you know, what Montessori materials? And we, there's an amazing blog that we wrote about Montessori without the materials. And I think the most yeah. important thing about Montessori is the non-material side of it. So the philosophy, understanding the child, respecting the child, observing the child, you know, really um, kind of, going back to the principles and basic understanding of what Montessori is and, and the things, the type of things that it allows for children to really build. And all of those are non-tangible, <laughs> like they're not actual materials. So I think, um, you know, whenever somebody asks me, what's the most important thing I need to know about Montessori? I always say it's understanding Montessori. <laughs> So <laughs> a really important um, point that you make, Simone. Um, okay, so we'll take another live question. I'm just um, seeing some pop up here. Uh, so, okay, so, th so this, um, I think it's Kershaw. So sorry if I uh, mispronounced that. Um, she's a, or he's asked, they've asked, how do you set up activities based on your child's interests without buying all kinds of toys for all types of their developments or interests, for example? Yeah, so again, like let's imagine you see a baby who is holding onto your finger like this. You'd be like, oh, I need to, I want to give them grasping opportunities. So I'm going to look for things that they can fit in their hands to hold on to. And if I don't want to buy any materials, well, then maybe it's my finger or maybe I have something in my, like a, a wooden spoon or something small that won't knock them in the face. But you could look for objects around your house that would still meet this need for grasping and hand-to-hand -hand transfer. 
and watching, oh, my baby's like wanting to roll over. If I put something interesting, just a little bit out of their reach, how can I make them, you know, uh, how can I encourage them and just support that interest? And I don't know if it will happen today. It might happen in two or three weeks, but I know that I provided them some opportunities. Um, so to set up activities for babies, it's I'd still like the idea of having an open shelf because they're learning to make choices. So you could just display a, a small number of things, like maximum six things that they would need. Um, if for a baby who can't actually wiggle over, when parents come to my class who have a non-crawling baby, I actually say, you need to observe even more because you need to see when your baby is all done with the thing that they're playing with so that you could maybe offer a different choice. And they, a baby who can crawl can go over and show you what they're interested in. And what I really love um, in our baby class is actually watching the babies. They walk over to something, they feel it for a minute and then they move on to the next thing and they feel it for a bit. And it, actually then they might sit and then they might post a ball for a little bit more. But there's so much movement going on. They don't necessarily sit for ages with one thing. And some other babies will really concentrate for a really long time. So it really depends on your child and how they're interacting with things. Um, but you can definitely do less is more because then you can really see what they're interested in. If they're not interested in anything on the shelf, then you can know, let's rotate these out and try them another time. Oh, the other thing about babies as well is that we're so used to seeing trays, but trays aren't super handy for young babies because it gets just in the way. So um, you don't need a tray for a baby. Oh yeah, they'll just end up banging the tray, which is, I mean, it's an, it's an exploration in itself. So you might want to have a tray for exploration, but yeah, definitely just keeping the items, you know, just on the shelf as a single item um, is yeah very helpful in that situation. Um, or like a treasure basket, Simone, what about something like that? Yeah, they can be beautiful for exploring. And I mean, we actually also use a lot of language baskets already with babies because then you can put like similar objects into one basket. So items from the kitchen. And then as they become toddlers, they'll realize, oh, this actually is a collection of things and we can name them as they're putting yeah. them in their mouths. But also, I mean, I love naming and giving rich language because they're like sponges and they're picking it all up. But I also love moments for silence. If your child's really concentrating, like not to say anything at all. And it really allows the child to concentrate and to make, they're basically in a stage of self-construction. So these are their experiences and let them have those experiences for themselves. Look, I made that ball move. I might try it again, you know, instead of saying, oh, you made the ball move. We can just see. Maybe they'll try it without <laughs> us doing saying anything at all. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the most important things is really trying to slow down, um, take a step back and watch your baby. So rather than and, and moving really quickly. So I find that sometimes you're like, oh, look here, look here, look here. And, and then, you know, they're moving quite quickly and talking at the same time. So the best advice, like you were saying, is really just to slow down. And, you know, you might want to present something, but just moving really slowly and separating those words from your movement so that your baby can really follow, um, you know, that ball being dropped in uh, without having that overwhelming of you know because they, they they operate a lot slower than we do so a lot of the time we think oh you know they can really keep up with how quickly and how fast we move but we really have to slow ourselves down and that's a big lesson you know as a parent or as an adult to actually have a bit of self-restraint and you know to just you know to it, and it's quite difficult to you know to try and keep your mouth closed or to your hands to yourself and, and observe so that's it's such a lovely thing to experience as well okay so ready for the next question simone we might have yeah. time for like two maybe two more guys or three more and then we'll um we'll do our little giveaway as well um we'll we'll, we'll pull the winner live um on here that will be really fun um okay so so this question, I'm not sure who it's from, but it's a live question. Um, they say, my son is 18 months old and has always been eating chalk or wax or beeswax or Play-Doh. Um, so I can't really leave these out, and he, but he really loves it. Um, and I have to stop the activity. So I feel like I'm quite exhausted developing these activities when most of the time he's just putting it in their mouth, even if it fits his interests um i feel it's a fail um, because he doesn't do it properly or as i planned um so what do i do in those moments yeah it is disappointing because you know that they're going to be interested in it but we also it's our job to keep them safe so when they're putting it in their mouth um then i would 
yeah, say, oh, it goes on the paper and just keep reminding them it goes on the paper or like with the Play-Doh instead of like, first I might try to show them, oh, look, and just like punch my finger very slowly and interestingly into the dough and see if that engages them more. Because usually what I find is when around 15, 16 months, I have like a coin box in my toddler class and the babies are just moving into that and they get the coin and they, the immediate thing they want to do is put it in their mouth because that's how they've been exploring the world so much. That's the most sensitive part of their body when they're babies. And then if I say, oh, look, and I very slowly, like um, Sylvia was saying, show, I don't use my words, I just say look, and then I show them very carefully how to drop it in. Then they go, oh, they become more interested in what the activity is for. So they, it could be just be that your son is like on that kind of cusp and that it's coming to be more. And maybe it only lasts 30 seconds this time and then 40 seconds the next time. So you can observe and see how that goes. Um, the other thing is just looking at the ways that they're needing to work with their mouth. Um, do they still have pacifiers or drinking from a bottle? Because that can keep the oral phase a little bit longer. So looking at, you know, when you do give up the bottle and the pacifier, those kind of, it will be less mouth sensitive. Um, or are there other ways to work the mouth? So for example, you can, um, Heidi Philippart Olcock talks about sucking yogurt through a straw to really like work mouth muscles in different ways. And it can be related also to, you know, like doing deep pressure massage and relaxing their nervous system in different ways too. Is it because they're like putting in their mouth to suck or, yeah. So it's hard to say without observing, but that's uh, what our answer is always. But uh, hopefully that gives you some ideas. And it's definitely no fail. It's just like, oh, this is interesting information. What works for my child? That has to just be our response because we can't take it personally. Like, I promise you, when you're a teenager, you don't want to take every developmental thing personally. <laughs> we just need to be their guide and their support and just say, oh, that's interesting. How can I adjust? Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's about lowering that expectation of, oh, I think my child should do this or that, you know, with this particular item and just allowing them to show you what it is that they might be developing or interested in something else that we might not have thought about. So maybe watching for those patterns or seeing if there's something in common with, you know, a lot of things. And like you said about babies, you know, mouthing, a lot of the time we get questions like, you know, why is my baby putting everything or how can I stop my baby from putting everything in their mouth? Um, Simone, how would you answer that question? <laughs> yeah, I think we wrote that in the book as well. It's like, that's actually put out things that they can put in their mouth because they are going to. So we talk about myelinization and for a nerve cell, I wish I could give you a little science lesson now, but basically a nerve cell has to have myelin around it to allow the electrical impulses to pass through. And when they're born, this, the cells that are myelinized tend to be around their mouth for feeding and their heart and that kind of thing. So that's going to be the most sensitive part of their body, um, which is why they put things to their mouth. And then the myelinization eventually moves out to their fingertips by the end of the first year. So that's when the mouthing starts to slow down a little bit more. So um, when people come to my classes and their baby puts things in their mouth and they say, oh, don't, don't put it in your mouth, I say, that's what they're there for. So that's how they're discovering their world and constructing themselves. Like if I've never seen a wooden thing before, I want to see and taste and explore it in the way I can. And that baby the mouth is so sensitive. Yeah, absolutely. so I make sure I clean everything quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course. Um, all right, so um, Chen Yi, who's also live, hi, and watching one of my lovely admin girls again, uh, she's asked, and I have another question about the books if it covers separation anxiety, independent play, and secure attachment. I'm not sure what expectations are developmentally appropriate for babies or if I should have any. Um, yeah, so we do cover all of those three topics. Um, we talk a lot about how um, we don't have to be the entertainer. And I think that's a big switch for us. We were talking before about how we think we need to set up all these activities and show them everything. And actually, it's sometimes our work that is something we're in control of. Um, there are going to be some babies that are more clingy and who will want to be nearby you. But maybe once they, it's going to be changing ourselves, right, from leading the play to playing with the child to then letting the baby take the lead. Um, so those kind of things can help. Separation anxiety often happens because they're learning that when something goes away and we come back again. Um, so we're really respectful. So if you're leaving to go to the kitchen, instead of just sneaking out because you don't want to upset them, I would rather tell them I'm going to the kitchen, the baby starts crying and then we come back and they learn to trust us because that, those little trips are going to get a little bit longer. I'm going to work now. And the trip is again longer. And we have tips in the book about if you have a carer who's going to be looking after your child or if you're 
using daycare, how you can also help with separating. Again, it's usually by being very honest, um, as much as possible, being there while they're getting to know the new person. So they become what we call a point of reference. We talk a lot in the book about having points of reference and consistency yeah. for the baby because that gives them safety and security. So if you always put the baby down to sleep, if you put them down in the same place every time, this is their cue, this is that place to rest. If you feed them in the same spot, this is their cue, this is the place that I feed. If you diaper them in the same place every time, this is my place to diaper. Um, and this person, I recognize them as one of my carers. I don't have lots of carers, but I have consistent carers who do similar things. Yeah, I think that's amazing. Um, really, really, really helpful. Um, okay, so we've just got one last question and then we'll do our little live. I'm just mindful of the time. We'll do our little live competition winner. Um, so Sheenie says, hi, Simone, you mentioned in the book that also included some RAE principles. What do you think are the main similarities or differences between RAE and Montessori? Oh, I love this question. I wish Jennifer was here because she's the one who's actually done the IRE training. I've done a lot of research on it, but she actually has done the training in herself. Um, but I just think they align so well together and it kind of articulates a lot of what we do in Montessori. So the idea of gentle hands actually is um, talked about a lot in the RIE training um, and how we handle them. And I think that's just showing respect with our hands. It totally aligns with Montessori. So it helps articulate that. So it's really clear and honest um, and for parents to understand. Um, also, they talk um, a lot about tarry time, which is giving a child pro and, or a baby time to process what we've said, um, which again is something we do in Montessori, but again, it gives articulation to some of the things that we do in Montessori unconsciously or when they're not actively, we might forget. So it's really nice to add them in. Um, they also talk about not putting a baby into any position. So in our Montessori training, we did prop them to sit and in Rye, they lie them down on their um, on their backs and not even on their tummies, where we, um, right, uh, sorry, RIE is Resources for Infant Educarers, and Magda Gerber kind of um, is one of the big people in that. Um, and J Janet Lansbury also follows as well, if you've ever heard of the, her work. Um, yeah, so they um, put them on their backs. So Jennifer actually did tummy time with her. Um, baby or with her third baby she hadn't done this idea she did the right training after her first two children and with her third she'd done the right training so she didn't put um bien do in any positions that she couldn't get into herself and she actually learned to crawl before she sat because she that's how her body was strong enough to get into a sitting position and i've got a video of her at 16 months old and it's amazing how capable her body is like it's stronger. It's like putting a ballerina into point shoes too quickly when you kind of push their development too fast. So I think the Rye approach and the differences are small things like the Rye put them on their lap to feed them where we have a little weaning table. Um, so the small differences are things that we just urge to the Montessori side and things anyway. I hope that helps. Yeah, absolutely. It really does help. And thanks guys for um, prompting us in, in the comments as well. Now, I am mindful that we uh, we have lots of questions that weren't answered, so we might open the discussion um, in our group or on the Facebook page, and you guys can just you know drop your comments, and maybe we can just answer a few of those for you. I'm so sorry that the time went so quickly. I really don't know how that hour just like went so fast. We could talk about Montessori and babies and development for you know for hours and hours and hours. I know Simone and I spent a good half an hour before we jumped on here having a chat as well. Um, so if you guys don't have any answers to your questions, believe me, they are all in this book. <laughs> and if they're not, I'm sure Simone and myself would love to jump on or even Jennifer, you know, she would love to come on and answer some of your comments. Um, she's such a inspirational part of this book. I know Simone and her worked so hard um, to get this book together. So we are so um, happy that they've actually come up with this and how exciting that they're coming up with the Montessori child. Wow. That's the best news I heard all night. <laughs> so <laughs> what I'm going to do, <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going Sorry, baby. One for you and 
and one for your friend that you tagged or nominated. Um, we'll reach out to you. I know who Alexandra Price is, so congratulations. Um, she's actually based, I think, in Texas. So I don't think they're awake right now, um, but I'm sure she'll be very, uh, she'll be very, very happy to hear that Alexandra Price has won. Oh, can you guys hear me now? Or no, some people said I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Thumbs up if anyone can hear me. Simone, you can hear me. That's good. I hear you. I hear you. Okay. Um, it was a bit, yeah, it was a bit up here. Yeah, maybe when I flipped the camera, um, yeah, you, you weren't able to hear me. But we were just spinning the wheel. Um, so somebody's won our giveaway. Thank you so much, Simone, for you and all the publishers for organising that giveaway. Um, guys, we're going to be posting the the um, the links below for the pre-order so that all of you get those amazing resources free with your pre-order. We'll link everything below. Um, Simone, is there anything that you want to say to us before you go? No, I just wanted to thank you all um, and thank you, Sylvia, for organising this. It was an absolute honour and really happy to get to speak with Australian friends because um, I haven't been back for a very long time. And, um, yeah, just hoping that there are more Montessori babies from birth, you know, and this will help, you know, spread the Montessori love farther, deeper and earlier. So thank you again, everyone. Absolutely. Thank you so much, guys. Show Simone your love. Hit that love button. Let's see all those hearts going non-stop and we're um we're really grateful Simone for you coming on to this QA. I wish I could talk to you for hours more. Um please send Juniper our um, regards and we hope that we maybe you guys can comment on some of our posts on Guide and Grow. Thank you so much. Bye everyone. Right. Bye bye everyone.